All right, I know you guys just wanna get into the video, but before we get into it, there are just a couple things that I want to mention. First off, I do now have a consistent uploading schedule. I hope to be uploading every Monday and every Thursday. So you guys can expect videos from me on those two days of the week, Monday and Thursday. And as you guys can see from this little teaser calendar, I guess, for this, uh, this year's April, um, we have today's video on Monday. And then on Thursday, we're gonna be starting up a brand new series, the Versus series where I will be versing things together. In this case, it's gonna be the Four Horsemen versus the Seven Sins, but that's gonna be a new series starting on Thursday. And then on Monday, we are going to have another video that you guys can look forward to. And as you guys can see as well, uh, every Monday and Thursday, we're gonna have videos. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I really hope to start streaming at some point. I would love to stream Keyforge here on YouTube, maybe stuff online, like on the Crucible Online but also maybe uh, just other stuff, like Keyforge related stuff, obviously. But I would love to start streaming. So if you guys do not want to miss out on any of the amazing upcoming Ember Media's content, be sure to subscribe. Um, but without further ado, let's get into the video. The fifth set of Keyforge, Dark Tidings, possesses a nautical theme that adds a lot of really neat character to the different houses. The set also explores the mechanic of exhausting things on the board as a mechanic, far more than any other set, and we see it not only as a form of disruption, but also as a price to perform certain abilities. One of the most noticeable places to find both these themes is in the nine artifacts with the ship trait, one belonging to each Dark Tidings house except Shadows which has three. Seven of these nine ships exhaust your own creatures in order for their effect to take place, while the remaining two just sort of do their own thing. These two oddities come in the form of the Fly Inspector and the Submersible. The Submersible just gives each friendly thief creature elusive while the tide is high. Twelve of the 28 thief creatures in Dark Tidings already have elusive to begin with, so the Submersible is useful for the other half at least. The Fly Inspector, on the other hand, is an artifact for which I hold much contempt. It gets destroyed when the opponent raises the tide, and has an action ability that lets you steal one ember when the tide is high. In my opinion, it's completely unnecessary for it to be destroyed outright when you lose the tide. That seems like way too much of a penalty. If it instead got exhausted or something like that, that would be more reasonable, especially considering that action steal one ember is not that broken of an ability to begin with. I just think the Flying Spectre is a very poorly designed artifact, and in the many times I've played with this card, I've only ever gotten to steal with it maybe once or twice. The other ships are all far more consistent in the way they operate, and while they may not be the most potent cards out there, they can still provide some decent utility when the right situation arises. We can round off Shadows with Archon's Revenge, whose artwork is super cool and reads, Action, exhaust up to two friendly Shadows creatures. For each creature exhausted this way, steal one Ember. Compared to the Fly Inspector, Archon's Revenge doesn't get destroyed when you lose the tide, nor do you even need the tide to be high in order to use it. The only stipulation is that you need ready Shadows creatures on your side of the board. Archon's Revenge could potentially steal twice as much as the Flying Spectre, and the only drawback when using it is that you may end up not getting to use your other creatures like Hobnobber or Shoulder Aid. So, not much of a drawback at all. With Shadows out of the way, let's next take a look at the SLRS Osteralis from Logos, which reads, Action, exhaust up to three friendly Logos creatures. For each creature exhausted this way, play the top card of your deck one at a time. Obviously, this play can be kind of risky, since at max capacity, it's essentially like playing three wild wormholes all in a row. It also combos nicely with cards like Townwitch Steelheart or Honor's Kesis, the potency of each of them depending on how many cards you've played in your turn. Sometimes you may just have to pass on using the SLRS Osteralis, but it's an interesting card nonetheless. In a similar vein, we have Exploratory Craft from Star Lions, which reads, Action, exhaust up to three friendly creatures. For each house represented among creatures exhausted this way, draw a card. This one is full of Star Lion's flavor in the way it involves creatures from different houses, and with a big battle line, you can choose whatever creatures are least value at the moment to exhaust. It can help you draw into pieces of your combo, or simply discover more of your upcoming deck. Extra efficiency is pretty much never a bad thing, and though exploratory craft isn't always the most consistent way of getting it, it still has its uses. The newest house, Unfathomable, has a ship of its own, the Ciceris. It reads, Action, exhaust a friendly unfathomable creature. If you do, exhaust up to three creatures and or artifacts. You get to hit three other items out there for the price of one, making it extremely useful for tapping problematic artifacts or creatures your opponent may control. The combo potential the Cicerus offers is pretty high as well, working well with cards like Sleep with the Fishes, Storm Surge, Tama of the Glow, and Call of the Void. House Untamed has a pretty funky ship, the Mysticetti. 
It reads, action, exhaust one or more friendly untamed creatures. If you do, give the Mysticeti three plus one power counters for each creature exhausted this way, and move it anywhere in your battle line as a creature with zero power and taunt. This card is weird, but also works really well within the Dark Tidings untamed meta. First off, it's cool how there's no real limit to the number of friendly untamed creatures you can exhaust with it, meaning you can bump it up to 9, 12, maybe even 15 power. This makes it combo really well with the other untamed cards that deal with plus one power counters. A few examples are Waste Not, Embermancy, and Primal Relic. There are only two ships left, the first of which is the ISS Indominus from Saurian. It reads, action, exhaust up to five friendly Saurian creatures. For each creature exhausted this way, deal one damage to each enemy creature. At maximum value, you're dealing 5 damage to each enemy creature, and in most situations that's almost enough for a one-sided board wipe, unless the opponent's board consists mainly of beefy Saurian or Sanctum creatures. It reminds me of Legion's March, where with that one you still get to use your Saurian creatures, but at the cost of everyone taking damage, not just the opponent. The ISS Indominus is great for exhausting some of those creatures that don't really matter too much in the long run, such as Sensor Philo or Bestiary Urso, and I especially appreciate how the effect isn't symmetrical. The last ship in this fleet is the SGS Illuminator from House Sanctum. It reads, action, exhaust up to four friendly Sanctum creatures. For each creature exhausted this way, stun and exalt a creature. With this one, you're pretty much setting up targets to hit later on, while simultaneously disabling threats that may exist on the board. It's a very interesting card, but one that I have very little experience with, although it seems like being able to repeat this every time you call Sanctum, perhaps multiple times in a row, could potentially be not only very disruptive, but could also lead to some pretty sizable Ember gain. And that rounds off the fleet of the Crucible, every ship card in Dark Tidings. These cards are usually pretty cool to find in a deck, since they're all rares, and even though they don't often get used to their fullest potential, they still combo nicely with the houses they appear in. They also add plenty of flavor to the set as a whole, something I'm never mad to see. Let me know what you guys think of these ships in the comments below, which one is your favorite, or how they've worked for you when you've played them. Thank you all so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you all again in the next one. See you later.